All right. Welcome to day two of the 2022 CYVP convening. Um, I am super excited about this day because it's all about you. Um, looking forward to hearing about the work that you guys have been engaged with, um, supporting the young people in your schools and in your community and working with uh, your community partners and your teams in the schools, parents. Um, so uh, this is something that you guys had requested last year. I think this is a, a terrific idea. Um, and we're gonna try to make it um, as if we were all together at uh, a convening somewhere tropical or freezing, wherever you like, I don't care. Um, and, you know, I want you to imagine if we're all kind of sitting in this really long kind of square table where we're just having a conversation with one another, learning from one another, um, and just being able to engage with one another. So we're, we've got this into, um, we've got three blocks. Uh, the first two blocks are gonna be 15 minute presentations by the sites. There's gonna be a, a follow-up five minute Q&A for that site. And then we're gonna have um, time at the end for you all to engage each other. Um, and I'm, it's gonna be open. You know, I, I think it's gonna be more time for you to talk with the individual sites that presented, but if there are other things that um, you have on your mind or you wanna share, um, you're welcome to that as well. So um, I, we're gonna, we're gonna kick this off. I'm gonna introduce you to my um, colleague, John Connolly. He's gonna be the, the director of the first block, trying to make sure that everybody um, stays on time and uh, go for it, John. Thanks so much, James. Uh, good morning, everybody. John Conley, again, Senior Program Officer with the LIST Safety and Justice Team. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your humble moderator for this first uh, group of site presentations uh, and excited to, to hear from folks. So I'll just kick it off um, with uh, introductions and, and agenda and then pass it over to our first speaker. And I would just note that um, clear themes that we'll be running through uh, the presentations you're about to hear, um, uh, community-based and external partnerships uh, and school-based um, uh, districts, um, mental health uh, service and support um, to students, um, and assessments, uh, uh, pr assessment process around um, ACEs or, or adverse childhood experiences. So first up, we're gonna hear from Lancaster County Public Schools in South Carolina, uh, and Sharon Novinger um, is going to be talking about community-based partnerships with schools, followed by our friends at El Rancho Unified School District in California. That's gonna be Dora um, uh, and Jeff Middleton. Um, and then lastly, uh, Laconia Public Schools uh, in New Hampshire are gonna hear from uh, Mackenzie Harrington uh, Bacote. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over uh, to Sharon at Lancaster. And again, as James indicated, uh, 15 minutes um, per presenter, followed by five minute Q&A for that particular site. Uh, and then hopefully uh, time at the end to have um, kind of the larger uh, group discussion and, and peer learning. So with that, Sharon, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. And I, I had it down for 35 minutes, but I'll be quick. No, just kidding, James. <laughs> James has, has prepped me already, so it's not 35 minutes. Um, as a, as John Fools. said, I'm Sharon. Oh, yes, exactly. It's a couple days late, though. As, a, as John introduced, I'm Sharon Novinger with Lancaster County Partners for Youth in Lancaster, South Carolina, but we partner with the Lancaster County um, School District. And also on my team, uh, Rodney Hamright and Tori Taylor are on right now. I know uh, we'll, we might have some others joining in just a little bit. So I'll be quick. Let me uh, share the screen before I forget. Um, hold on a second. Okay. And um, let me put the slide. Okay. Can y'all see that? Okay. The slide is just one slide. Okay. So just really quickly, um, this is going to be, you know, a very paraphrased overview of our community partnerships and how working together with assessments has led us to several focuses, including our current focus on mentoring, preventing youth violence, um, providing school-based violence um, and providing the necessary mental health solutions. Um, and, and also Rodney and Tori, if I forget anything in this, please feel free to, 
to uh, say say something. Um, anyway, but so while we know this approach has worked for us and continues to work in our community, we recognize that all not all communities work in the same manner of ours as the same manner of ours. And our collaboration um, includes representatives from government, schools, nonprofits, faith-based, and foundations. As you can see, the the logos um, with, that represent these agencies. And of course, here's our uh, disclaimer from the OJJDP uh, at everything and how we are funded um, through, uh, through the same similar grants you guys are funded. And James, I'm sorry, I, did, I should have asked you this. Was I, am I supposed to read this too or just have it there? Okay, good, just checking. Um, so how we uh, began, um, so our collaboration we have on the screen mirrors a history of uh, working together from various agencies working together. Now the heads um, or the directors of different agencies and organizations have changed, of course. But um, since 1998, we've had some, some, some resemblance of coalitions and uh, partnerships. And I'll talk to you though about that very um, briefly. Uh, in like it says on the slide, we began at a, as a governor's youth council and quickly became a SAMHSA funded drug free community grant. Um, and we received that funding for 10 years, which of course was the maximum. And together with that funding, you know, the agencies working together, um, you know, building that trusting relationship, you know, we received about $25 million in prevention funding in the first 10 years. And we also did community forums, legislative breakfasts merchant covenants and hosted a natural a national uh, rural prevention uh, conference that uh, it's still right now we've had it uh, I think we're on the 12th or 11th no, I'm sorry the 12th or 13th year uh, and we're trying to do it again this summer later this summer um, and y'all will be hearing more about that hopefully um, but it's going to be a rural conference it's um, not rural of course it's rural focused, but it's going to be a virtual conference um, as well. And let's see. And so I wanted to just show you, yes, we have this history, but as James and I were talking about, um, we, you know, through assessments, we would always say, okay, what are the hot topics or what are the needs that our, our um, youth, our children and youth of our county need to, to address? And I will clarify, our school district is a countywide school district. Um, so we only have one here. So we do recognize that that is easier to work with bureau bureaucratically as well. And um, so just really quickly. So we were looking at, okay, what, what um, are the needs of our community? And we realized that, that we had a real problem that was starting to happen. And it was that the number of DUIs were soaring in our county. Um, and especially, unfortunately, it was soaring with kids under the age of 21, which is, of course, the drinking age. But we were having a lot of DUI crashes. Um, not all were fatal, but unfortunately, um, it was still involving, you know, uh, substance abuse of some sort. And so our solution was a community-wide effort involving all aspects of the community, and we called it Take You Out of DUI. So um, the funding was received to support the project from four different federal and state grants. And we had representatives of the coalition from across the county, um, including our school district. And one grant application that was awarded to the sheriff's office was the only one of three funded in the, in the nation. Um, our boots on the ground approach um, you know, included uh, safety checkpoints, saturation points, party patrols, uh, patrols of youth drinking areas, uh, compliance checks, and a tip line. And where appropriate, we worked in tandem and boosted events to keep up public awareness and outreach in the schools, um, from town hall meetings to health classes to athletic games, uh, Learn PSA, which is our local uh, TV um, all access channel. We had Learn TV PSA contests for students. And actually, we've actually had a PSA contest in our grant um, here for the prevention of bullying and, um, and school-based violence as well. But anyway, our community partnership, like I said, I just wanted to um, give a quick overview of our community partnership that we had before this grant. Our community partnership resulted in the following. Um, we had a number of safety checkpoints in Lancaster County, increased 89% in that year. The number of individuals in the county arrested for driving under the influence 
uh, of alcohol, uh, let's see, um, increased 32%. And most important, the number of DUI crashes involving individuals under 21 decreased 21% in one year. And for individuals 21 and old, over, um, decreased 22% because we were having that monitoring. So high school seniors that reported using alcohol in the past 30 days decreased by 6% during that past year. And binge drinking was reduced by 18.4% over that same period. So in addition to changeable outcomes, we forged relationships with law enforcement that, and in fact, the chief of police was a founding member of the coalition. Um, and so with that history, we had um, a good, uh, a good track record of working together and a good trust, you know, with each other. Um, and I'm not saying everything was very easy or whatever, you know, because there's systems, you know, there's um, entrenched systems in place that, you know, different organizations have a different ways of, of doing things and everything. And so even like, for example, my, um, my organization, Lancaster County Partners for Youth, uh, you know, our mission is to, to elevate, educate, and enhance the children and youth of Lancaster County, which that correlates with, of course, you know, preventing uh, underage drinking, as well as, of course, DUI crashes and everything. So that's what, that's just one example of how we all lined up. Granted, it's not a direct output of what we do, but it helps build and strengthen our, um, our outreach. And so, so after we got, uh, we finished with this, um, with this uh, community project, we were looking at um, different assessments and I don't, let's see, we were looking at, um, you know, uh, different statistics and everything. And um, so we were continuing to assess the county's youth and provide protect protective factors. And one area of need kept appearing and we saw it was a dearth of medical, of, um, sorry, of mental health services, especially for our students. And these assessments, as you can see on the slide, these assessments have led, um, been led by the school district. Uh, so we we have been lucky in the past um, 20 years with our surveys that we've done for the coalition that the school district actually has uh, written point on a lot of them. And we're, we've been able to get into schools and do a variety of assessments with the students and surveys with parents as well. And so anyway, so with these assessments, having that information, we've been able to apply and receive a total of now $32 million in grants. So we're really excited about that. And you could see, um, you know, we've, we're focusing on the different risk factors, community, family, school, and individual and peer risk factors. Um, and so once we were starting to call the latest of information after our take you out of DUI project, um, you know, all these partners uh, had previously worked together and you can see some of this, uh, some of the statistics that were coming in, you know, were, were not good, um, obviously. Um, and the schools that we knew we needed to focus on were Clinton Elementary, Rucker Middle School and Lancaster High, um, which were, Lancaster High at that time was the biggest school in our county. And it is also a feeder school. So students going to, to um, Clinton Elementary go to Rucker, and then they go to Lancaster for their, uh, for their senior high years. So uh, we wanted to focus on that, um, that attendance zone uh, with our efforts because we were seeing these reports. Uh, they were also not only in school were the highest number of behavioral issues in the community, that's where the majority of the violent crimes were happening in our community as well. So it mirrored, the school mirrored the community. Um, so anyway, once we were seeing all this data that we're like, okay, now our focus needs to be mental health um, and mental health services provided or additional mental health services provided to this area. Um, anyway, once we were calling that data, we quickly contacted a lot of our community partners who had previously worked together with us in the coalition, as well as on Take You Out of DUI. Um, and it was determined uh, once, you know, we had the meeting uh, and it was determined by the South Carolina Department of Mental Health District Office that they could provide more help, mental health services. And as a group, we started looking for additional funding to tackle these arising issues as preemptively as well. 
Um, additionally, we looked at the What Works Clearinghouse and um, we saw, you know, we learned about the Check and Connect programs, uh, mental health first aid, and also the after school program. We knew from um, another project, uh, we knew, you know, that the Harlem Children's Zone was being incredibly um, effective. Uh, and that, you know, uh, that they were having after school uh, programs that we wanted to model our after school programs at. And so it's going to be a multi prong approach. Um, and so the Catawba Community Mental Health, uh, which is the department of our local department of South Carolina Department of Mental Health, uh, now provides dedicated staffing at our schools. Actually, we just added a, another um, several uh, more hours for the therapists at our, our alternative school for where the students from Rucker and Lancaster go as well um, after they've been removed from their home schools. Uh, but anyway, so, and also mental health first aid of which Tori um, is, is part of uh, mental health first aid is now certifying our teachers and agencies, check and connect, which Rodney as well as after school is helping with so much. Um, they provide direct mentoring to the students and our outcomes include, but are not limited, um, to tracking students in these programs uh, for repeat behavioral issues, suspensions, violence, as well as community violence. And highlights include, um, though, like I said, you know, we're small in scale to other grantees, I know, but um, the highlights uh, include the impact, you know, we've really started to see impact that we had with the students in Check and Connect, after school and mental health counseling. Uh, the 337 students in Check and Connect and after school have increased their grades and continue to have zero behavioral issues or behavioral incidents. Um, and so during the last reporting time, there are 60 students that have been uh, benefiting from seeing the therapist, uh, the mental health, um, the local mental health department therapist. And of those, 47 were referred to the school by the school's DSS or DJJ and 13 were self-referred. 39% um, were treated for depression, 17% for anxiety, 6% were treated for PTSD, and 25% for ADHD, um, as well as 13% were treated for either conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. And post-CYVP, we continue to seek funding um, to increase evidence-based program and direct therapy. Um, and you could see, like, I think, based on other calls we've had, these are similar to uh, other uh, recipients, grant recipients on this call as well. But our suspensions, um, you know, are, are are terrible, you know, for, for our high school and, and also for our middle school. Um, and, you know, with looking at our suspensions and our truancy, we really know we need to focus on our, you know, mentoring uh, with our with our students, with our after school program, and you know, with different behavioral mental health um, efforts. And so together, with all this together, and based on the partnerships that we've formed in the past, and we continue to form to add um, new partners on as well, you know, we know we can we can move the needle on this and really impact the students that need to be impacted. Um, I know Rodney and Tori, did I miss, what did I miss? Or did I miss anything? Now you covered basically, you got it covered good. Okay, good. <laughs> um, Great, so do I you think... guys have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, John. Sorry. No, no, please. Yeah, I think we can then open it up um, for questions um, for Sharon by by peers. And like I said, you know, this is just how it how our um, partnerships have worked. You know, and the impact we've had with our partnerships. Um, you know we're able to go and just see, okay, what's the next arising trend? What's, I think, based on the numbers and the data we're seeing, I, um, and I think you guys all can agree, I think mental health um, will definitely be a focus for a while. I don't, and I all the, you know, the ripple effects. Sorry, I had a question. I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead. 
So I, I was so looking at your, the data on the uh, so you provided data that's showing that like African Americans are suspended at a higher rate than white students. Can uh, um, can you speak to no? I, speak, is that what I yes. saw? Yeah. Well, this is where it's a little misleading, and I should have addressed this. Um, and thank you. It's really not at a higher rate in relation to the demographics of the school. So it's, it is, um, yes, there is a little bit of a higher rate, but the demographics of the school pretty much mirror this. I mean, it's off by like four or 5%. Um, Rodney, is that, did I state that correctly or? Yes, you did. Uh, yeah, you did state that the demographics is higher. This is a little uh, misleading uh, graph here, but uh, mm -hmm. that's just the way it is here in our area. And I should have, and I, I should, um, if I use this again, I think I will put that on there, what the, what the demographic breakdown is. I had actually meant to do that, so. Because yeah. I was wondering if there was anything you were doing to address that disparity, but it sounds like it, it's not, you're not having to address it in that way. Uh, right. Uh, it's our county, our county um, is interesting. It's <laughs> overall, the county is, <laughs> I know Rodney is flat. Um, overall, the county is primarily, um, I think it's pretty much like 65% uh, Caucasian and um, county wide. However, Lancaster, the, the Clinton to Rucker to Lancaster is the, um, is the most uh, African, probably has, um, I would say it's reverse even. It's more it like 65%, it mm -hmm, 65 it to 70% African-American in those three schools that are in that mm -hmm. um, attendance zone. And that's where the city of Lancaster itself is. Now the unincorporated areas in the area like that's closer to Charlotte is um, Charlotte, North Carolina is probably like 75% uh, Caucasian. And so it's right. it's a whole, it's, it's always a battle of demographics. I know one time I was sitting in a presentation um, with the Department of Rural Health in South Carolina. And I can't remember Rodney, if you were in this conversation or a presentation or not, but also, but they were saying how in the city of Lancaster, 100% of the um, of Pacific Islanders, 100% of Pacific Islanders living in the city of Lancaster were in poverty. And at first, mm -hmm. when you look at it, you're like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And then you realize, well, there's only one family of Pacific Islanders in the city of Lancaster. In the city. And yeah. so, you know, <laughs> and we're like, wait a minute. And, and they're just, you know, they're actually located like a, a block away from my building. So um, yes, they are in poverty, you know, and so anyway, um, so we do have to be careful with that. But thank you for bringing that up, Jeff. I'd like to just jump in with one question as well, Sharon, the, the Coalition for Healthy Youth. Um, talk to me a little bit more about that group. It seems pretty well organized and, and not dependent on kind of one funding source. And, and has that been formalized now through an MOU? And then also, is that is that really driven or staffed by um, a, a district, uh, a school district staff, or is it mm -hmm. um, supported through nonprofit partnerships or other? Uh, just curious to hear a little bit more about that group, if you could. Okay, so it was um, the Coalition for Healthy Youth was the uh, the agents or the it actually the fiscal there is a fiscal agent for the Coalition for Healthy Youth and it's the Children's Council which is not um, school based or I'm sorry mm -hmm. it's not a school entity but it yes. does have a lot of programs in the school they do everything from um, teen pregnancy prevention programs to truancy to um, home visitation programs, um, the whole gamut. And so, so there are the, the fiscal agent. Um, it's not a separate like 501. And I'm sure one day, like the Children's Council would love it if they had de a dedicated staff person for the coalition. Um, but uh, so like when we do meet in person, uh, you know, they had always were able to get some sort of funding for um, like a food food or whatever. So those staff members would go and do the, you know, the legwork and everything. 
um, to help set up the meetings, all that. But for the coalition, um, it's based, we still mirror that um, Drug Free Communities grant uh, set up in which, you know, you had to have a parent, you had to have faith-based, you had to have law enforcement, um, schools, uh, nonprofits, business. And so we have a whole um, uh, representation of, of people, you know, and so that's actually been incredibly health, helpful um, and healthy too um, for us to, to work together, you know, to continue to get different funding sources. So um, at different times, different people lead, you know, what they feel is the, um, the issue that we need to focus. The school is an imperative part. The school district is an imperative part of, of the coalition. That's, you know, um, it's interesting. We, I can't remember when this was. It might've been like eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, there was uh, a mentorship um, formed with another county about an hour from here in South Carolina. And in which um, we would mentor them to establish a similar coalition because uh, they received a drug-free communities grant and everything. They did not have the buy-in of the school district. And it really, it, it, didn't, I, it did not succeed. You know, it was, they had some state buy-ins and they had, you know, um, also they didn't have the buy-in of the school district and their superintendent kept changing as well. So it was, um, it wasn't, you know, successful. So like I said earlier, we know it doesn't always work in various in other communities, but we've been very lucky with that. Great, that's that's really helpful, really insightful. Any final questions for Sharon and her team? Great. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. We're going to move on uh, now uh, to the El Rancho Unified School District uh, presentation. Again, they're in California and uh, look forward to hearing from you, Dora Soto Delgado and Jeff Middleton, um, talk a little bit about uh, adverse childhood experiences and work they've done on an assessment screening protocol that was developed as part of a overall uh, outreach and, and programming effort on student mental health. Uh, Dora, Jeff, take it away. Yeah, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, today we will be providing uh, information that will highlight uh, programs that we have here that absolutely address ACEs. We have uh, Jeff Middleton, our mental health liaison, uh, Sonia Guevara, also mental health liaison, and Sandra Robles, uh, who is our program specialist uh, that oversees our social emotional learning that we'll present today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sonia and I'm presenting um, just to get us started a little bit about our El Rancho Unified School District mental health program. And so in terms of goals, um, you'll see on this slide here, we were starting from a place of wanting to focus in three main areas. Um, overall, increasing the um, accessibility to mental health services. Uh, we. Uh, had that goal around annually, we wanted to increase um, the services by 20%, the amount of students that were being served. Um, also, um, the student referrals to community agencies. Um, and so um, you'll see here in the first section where we're looking at outcomes. So how are we going to increase first our services um, annually by 20%? Our access referral is where sort of we, I would say, first started to uh, centralize our referrals. And so we wanted to make sure that all school sites had the same uh, referral process. Um, and again, the, those referrals were uh, managed through our district student services. And so uh, we would uh, provide training to all sites at the beginning of every school year. Uh, we would reintroduce our referral form. We try not to deviate so much from uh, the form year to year, just so that it would not be perceived as something new. Um, and it was familiar to staff, right? It took several school years, but we got to a point where access everyone now attributes or can understand that that is our mental health referral form in our district. As things have moved in terms of technology, we've adapted that to a virtual format um, as we had to do with most of our services. So our school staff, uh, we also were 
um, supported through grant funds and then our district was able to absorb several positions to increase. Uh, I actually was on our team uh, back when it was just one counselor and that, that was myself. And so now we have a team of 13 mental health counselors in our district, multidiscipline in their own backgrounds and that are providing a lot of this coordination at the school sites we found was very important so that if um, any provider, any teacher, any staff have questions about mental health services or are uh, there's sort of a process between you have a concern for a student and you're going to make a referral. So our counselors uh, provide that support to our staff. Our internship mental health program is also a big part of the success of our program. And so um, currently, uh, we have about 23 of our interns, and I'll talk more about our partnerships um, on the next slide. Um, really, we're looking at providing options for our families, right? And so the next section around, or the next bullet around uh, increasing the referral to community agencies. So our district team um, observed a high wait list um, in our community agencies um, and also families in, a, we have like a very small community here in Pico Rivera and families wanted resources locally, right? Within the city limits or I mean more familiar um, in a setting like the schools. And so that was also a big part of our approach in making sure that we would increase um, services at the school site or we would develop partnerships with community agencies to have more of that communication, right? And so what was helpful to our partnerships absolutely was the uh, communication with our staff through our community partners. And I'll speak to that a little bit also in our next slide, but that universal intake was imperative to making sure that um, it was streamlined, everybody's on the same page about how to make a referral and what res resources were out um, in the community and available to our families. Um, the reduction in mental health stigma was also part that we saw um, an, an important part to address, right? And so we just have here a few of our campaigns. Uh, text to tip is one that we continue with, and that is a local sort of number that our students and our families, we have a fun little engaging advertisement where it looks like a little phone and um, students, families, staff, it's available to all community members. Um, for any situations that might seem unsafe, we also have um, several instances where students refer peers um, because of behavior maybe they've observed or they're concerned for. So we can move on to the next slide. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, Jeff, you want to move? Okay. So we'll talk more about our partnerships in this slide. Um, so currently, our mental health agency partners um, are as listed here, right? And we, you can see, our longest standing partnership is with Alma Family Services over 10 years of partnership with that agency. And so what we find um, really helps with the success of our partnerships is the ongoing communication. I can think to a few we've seen turnover with our agencies. Um, and so as long as our staff our, are trying to communicate and, and have that ongoing communication with our agencies, because a lot can get lost in translation when we don't have that ongoing consistent, right? So if there's a change in a, in a staff person, if there's a change in therapist, if there's a change in the wait list, what's happening, making sure that we have regular communication um, is imperative to the success of those partnerships. Also so that our families don't feel as though um, they are being referred to an unfamiliar place, right? So we know who the therapist is going to be that we're referring them to, who their supervisor is, how long they can expect to wait, what the process will be like to do intake. And we found that that really reduces the amount of maybe stigma or hesitance from our families and that they're more willing and open to um, sort of we vouch, right? We're sort of the, the um, liaisons between that. We say, you know, we've we know about this agency, this is what they have available to you. We offer them a space in our district to provide services and families are more willing. Um, and so we manage the communication, make sure that we know who's full, when they're full, who can take more, more um, referrals. And also we try to assign our agencies to um, sort of like geographically. So we have elementary schools that feed into middle schools and we try to pair them with the same agency that we prioritize referrals so that it's familiar to students too and therapists can maybe follow them from the middle to the high school. So lastly, I'll speak to our partnerships, right? Which is another part 
of our internship program. Um, and so we currently we've been growing it, but I think what I want to highlight here is that every year we um, ask our interns for feedback on our program. We really engage them because we know, um, because we know our interns that are in our program will then go back and maybe refer interns from their younger cohort to then continue that. So we find that engaging the interns and also a majority of our staff that are now hired are previous graduates of our intern program. And so when interns see that, um, it increases their interest in our site. We focus a lot on training and we focus a lot on those learning opportunities. We can move to the next slide. Um, so I'll just move briefly through this one, but this just goes into just historically the pattern of mental health and how we've seen uh, the improvement over the years, right? And so we've definitely been able to increase accessibility. I'll highlight that from 2013 to 2021, we have an average of 1,258 students served by our mental health program and staff interns. That's in our district of about 8,000. Um, and so we are really meeting um, those needs of our students and really looking to be dynamic and creative with uh, the services that we provide. So I'll sort of uh, pass it on to my colleague here. I know we have a lot to cover. We have a short amount of time. So Jeff, you want to take it away the next slide? I'll go as quickly as possible. <laughs> so um, so when we're talking about uh, ACEs, I think, you know, at work, in a school district, one of the most important roles we can play is the identification of students who, who have a high number of ACEs or uh, adverse child uh, experiences. We want We want to get we want to be able to identify those students uh, as quickly as possible so we can get them linked to services. We know that the earlier um, students are, or young people are connected to services, the better the um, prognosis and outcome, right? So schools play such a crucial role in doing that. We, we really look at, you know, that identification process as a really important uh, role. So we have many different ways in which we receive uh, referrals from uh, from our you know to identify students that that may need additional services. Um, so I'll show real real fast. So like North Park Academy of the Arts uh, staff can go to the website and they can you know click on what we call a care referral uh, and they can make a referral for students if they're concerned about uh, a student. So that'll come up. They fill that up and one of our mental health counselors will follow up uh, with that with that staff person or student. Parents can also make a referral mental health referral. Students can also self-refer. So we get some referrals that way. We also get referrals from our administrators for uh, through like ODRs or you know students are acting out, externalizing. But we also uh, work to uh, develop a screener because we this started during the pandemic when we had you know students were distance learning. We weren't able to identify students that were struggling who needed additional help. Um, so we developed a screener. Let's see if I can get to this. Um, where we were asking students questions around like, how are they doing emotionally um, to figure out who needed support. So first thing we had to do is we had to send out an opt out form though. So we send out, uh, you know, a, a message to our, our parents and caregivers to let them know they had the right to opt out of this. So, so that was the first thing. And then we created an opt out list and we had students that did not take the screener. So that's kind of an important uh, beginning step. Uh, then we, uh, so those students that whose parents did not opt out, we, we would administer the, the screener. We pulled questions from multiple different sources so we could kind of create our own on a Google form um, because some of them were really long and didn't really fit our needs. And some of them, you know, just didn't ask the, the questions that we're really looking for. Um, so we were able to kind of, you know, pull them and, and some of them aren't developmentally appropriate either for our age groups. So we had to create an elementary one and, and a secondary one. So we kind of went through like we're asking questions around like how are you feeling how, how have you been feeling happy this week you been feeling sad you feeling lonely do you do you are you uh, uh you know feeling like uh, you don't have any friends um are you having difficulty making friends so we could follow up with those students we could run the data we could filter it and identify them and connect them put them in social skills groups or some other things where we can address them but mostly because we can do an assessment to look at whether they they have any any uh how many ACEs they have, right? So it's, it's kind of starting this process because if they're, they're exposed, then, then it's gonna manifest in these ways. So that's the elementary screener. Um, and we're, we're definitely, if you want to email us, we can share these with you as well. So I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. Um, at the secondary level, it's, you know, different wording. Um, kind of, you know, for example, this question here, we're asking overall, how are you doing emotionally? One, I'm coping well during this time. Two, I'm struggling emotionally, but I'm coping well enough Three, I'm struggling emotionally and, and I need additional mental health support. And four, I need immediate 
mental health support. So we had a team, and once we administered the screener, we had a team meet immediately, run the data, and we'd go through and identify those students who needed to be followed up with immediately. Obviously, that last one we would follow up with immediately. But we were also asking questions around uh, 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 food security, around um, housing issues. During the pandemic, we also knew that students were, there was a decrease in child abuse reports nationwide, not because child abuse had decreased, but because students weren't going to school and being identified uh, you know, by you know, talking to their teacher safely. Sometimes the person who was doing the abuse was in the same room with them while they were online. So, we, so having a space where they could say, I don't feel safe uh, in my home or I'm being bullied or cyber bullied. Um, so we were able to go out directly ask that and then we had, you know, we would follow up with those uh, immediately if they weren't feeling safe. Um, so we had a whole whole list, uh, list of questions, also asking if they felt connected to at least one uh, adult at school. Um, you know, when we do our, our broader uh, questioning, we get like an open-ended question around what percentage don't feel connected uh, to school, uh, but we don't know the specific students. So once, once we know those names, we can, we can directly try to work with some of those students to try to get them connected to somebody um, at, you know, at the school site. Uh, we were able to do that at you know, one of our sites, our continuation high school, um, you know, kind of get them connected. So these are what, some of the ways in which we uh, work to identify students so that we could follow up. Once I, once I identified, um, then our mental health counselor, or sometimes our mental health interns went from one of our universities that uh, Sonia was sharing about, my follow up with that student, complete an assessment. So we'll do a suicide, um, homicidal ideation assessment, um, just make sure they're, they're safe in that way. Um, and then we develop, you know, based on the assessment, we're gonna develop a treatment plan with them around how, how we can provide uh, support. And it, so we're, you know, we're, we're assessing for ACEs through, through that universal form that Sonia was talking about. So, but a lot of times it takes a relationship to be able to eventually find out what's been going on. Um, so you talk about like one of the ACEs questions around sexual abuse, that doesn't come out right away, especially when talking to a student. That takes time, you have to build relationships, you have to build that connection, build that trust, before that information comes out. So we're starting that assessment process, not expecting to get that information sometimes immediately. We sometimes we do, but a lot of times it comes out of, uh, of a relationship where we're, we're connected and they feel safe with us over time. And then that information can be more disclosed. But we are asking those questions with our caregivers and parents and knowing that sometimes we'll get that immediately and sometimes we won't. Um, if they have Medi-Cal, we can link them to one of our mental health uh, agencies that we have partnerships with. And, and then we set up rooms at our school sites where students can come and receive services at the school site. Um, so this is the form we use and integrated in the form are all like the ACEs you know, questions we're trying to get to that. So we're looking at you know, our exposure to trauma, we're looking at domestic violence, we're looking at DCFS involvement, um, you know, uh, uh, alcohol and substance abuse. So if they, they click that, we're gonna link them to like Lakata, for example, our Los Angeles alcohol and drug abuse program where they can follow up, provide mental health services or mental health treat, you know, treatment. So for they have, they, they're able to work with anything, like they, they don't have to have an addiction themselves, just if they're connected to uh, that world, we can link them to those services. So um, we have, and then, and then we can also do an assessment. Our assessment's also gonna help them get uh, linked to one of our counseling groups. We do a lot of counseling groups with our mental health counselors and interns. So more grief and loss groups lately um, due to COVID. We do a lot of social skills groups, anxiety, depression groups, children and change. That's for our students whose parents or family members going through divorce um, or separation, or they live, you know, with a, a with a, in a non-traditional family unit. Um, expressive arts. Um, so really trauma focused is a lot for our students who don't don't have language to talk about it, but they can do it through art. So we we do a lot of art with them where they you know can use um, different mediums to be able to express themselves and connect with each other. Uh, around that rather than, you know, you, using their words, especially, you know, our younger kids, but even our high school kids don't always have words, um, especially when the trauma that occurred to them happened at a pre-verbal state or, you know, a very young uh, emotional state. So um, turn over to Sandra Robles to talk about. Thank you, Jeff. John, I think we've gone over. Do I have a, give me two more minutes and then we'll be done. Is that okay? Absolutely. 
Thank you, John. So here we really just wanted to highlight some of the work that we've done around social emotional learning and that really SEL supports children who have been exposed to adversity or are currently experiencing some trauma. Um, so last year we found it really important to implement an evidence-based evidence SEL curriculum so that we had that consistency right across schools from classroom to classroom. So as you look here, um, we did purchase licensing for um, second step for our elementary and middle schools and then character strong is a platform or the curriculum that we're utilizing for all three of our high schools so you he see here we asked our teachers to commit to one time a week right for one lesson and you see here the breakdown right from k to one obviously it's just 15 to 20 minutes per week that they're committing to um, and then you second to fifth 25 to 30 minutes and then also for our middle school pop population it's about 20 25 minutes. All of our high school lessons are typically about 30 minutes. There's a lot of extension activities, right, that our teachers can utilize. So they have an activity to do every single day of the week. But again, what we asked our staff to commit to at least one time per week. Um, and so that's really what we really focused on last, last school year and this year. But not only are we um, implementing that SEL curriculum, but really stressing and providing support to our staff and our support staff and infusing SEL throughout the day, right, um, to really help meet the needs of the whole child. So as we look at, right, what are we doing? Um, we're looking at um, positive greetings at the door, morning check-ins, our community circles, our classroom meetings, as some of our teachers call them, to really share and solve problems that are occurring on a day-to-day -day with our students, um, the use of mindful brain breaks or brief movement breaks right throughout the day at different times of transition, after lunch when our kids are coming in very wiggly, right, and they really need to regroup. Um, and so this really uh, reminded me of what Allison told us and talked to us about yesterday, right, as she was reviewing uh, that section two of the toolkit, and she talked to us about encouraging specific interactions with students and those classroom strategies strategies and techniques that are recommended. And this is really a lot of work that we've been doing for the past seven years as it involves a PBIS framework as well. All of our school sites, our 14 of our sites are PBIS schools. Um, and so really all of that work, right, is um, embedded with the SEL work with the trauma-informed practices that we're implementing within our district. Um, and so overall, we really want to move away from just punishment or being punitive and really just starting to be um, supportive to, to our students. Um, and that is it for that piece. I think it goes back to Jeff. It just really, we, you know, we always want to end on a, a great note, right? So um, I know James asked for it and here it is. Can everybody see it? Don't know. There it is. And it actually rings. So you can actually move it and it rings. So we're very, we're very proud, not only of our work, I know of everybody here uh, you know, today, of everybody's work um, in supporting students. Um, we're appreciative of you know, being recognized for the work. Uh, it, it involves a lot. So it's not just a mental health program as you know, staff uh, was mentioning. It, you know, we're really looking at preventing and, and making sure that we address the overall health and well-being of our students and remove any barriers to their success at school. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. As will we say, we, we're trying to work ourselves out of a job. Unfortunately, that's never going to happen. But, um, you know, we need to, to make sure that we're doing the work and continuing to grow because there's always room for growth. So with that, thank you very much. And we apologize for going um, over just a, a tad. There was a lot to say, and I'm sure we could go on, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you all, really uh, appreciate um, this presentation. Just a lot of great uh, information. Um, I'm gonna open it up uh, to questions um, by the peers, though I know I'll, I'll have at least one question for you, Jeff, on, on those forums, which are fantastic, but wanna give an opportunity um, uh, for your fellow peers um, to ask questions first. So open the floor. Hi, this is Nicole. I have a question about um, your referral system. So I thought it was amazing to have it um, on the website and that you know anyone could fill it out. I'm curious if you all have experienced um, 
as you try to make referrals, all the mental health folks are full, like community and in school, and how you address those pieces when, when you have a referral that you know a student is at risk. I, Sonia or Jeff, go ahead. You want to take that one, Jeff, or you want me to? Yeah, I can. I can go. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a great, great question. It's something that we've really struggled with this year because of that mm -hmm. shortage. And actually, the the sold out of Ryan. The matter of fact, sold out of Ryan is really about that, the the shortage and you know some attempts to try to increase funding to bring in more mental health um, supports in schools. So yeah, typically we had you know about fifty percent of our students had you know, have Medi-Cal and we were able to link them to outside agencies and they'd be able to serve them. This last year, we almost, we've made very few connections. Like we, we, we try to refer them and they're like, we don't, we're not accepting any new referrals. So we had, we've had to get very creative around that our school site needed to serve them. Fortunately, we, we are, are uh, we had some additional funding to be able to increase our uh, mental health counselors. We, we now have one mental health counselor at every school site, uh, five days a week. And then that intern program really helps us incredibly. So we have 22 interns that are assigned, you know, throughout the district so that we can actually directly meet the need. So, and then we're using group quite a bit. We, you know, there's a, the research shows that group is, is just as efficient and effective, uh, or it's, a, it's more efficient and it's just as effective as individual uh, treatment. So we use, we use a lot of group in, in order to see more students who provide, um, you know, that, that support with, with, you know, the, the, less resources that we have. Um, so those are really the, the main strategies that, that we've, um, we've been you know, uh, working on. Hopefully in the future, we'll, that, that shortage of mental health folks will, uh, will decrease. So we'll see. I will say too that here in LA County, uh, one thing that we've been very fortunate has been that although our community agencies have been deeply impacted with understaffing um, and also the transition back to in-person, we didn't even mention that piece, right? Um, but um, for the most part, any student who is coming off of a hospitalization for suicidal ideation at that highest risk we would consider is directly linked to an agency by either the hospital or we have partners that have made space for those select few that when they're um, um, finishing a hospitalization, if they're referred by a hospital, then they can get in. So it's kind of others where we found to be more, we've had to be more creative with those that are not at that highest level, but absolutely um, would benefit from support. And if I could add one more thing, so that what, what Sandra Robles was sharing about our SEL, it's so essential that that happens. So that when you're doing the, the, the uh, community circles in, in, in the class and there's those connections so that those issues can be addressed by the teachers you know, it built into the curriculum that that's going to make that makes a huge difference around meeting those needs so that we can identify we can be really clear and which students need tier two and tier three services. I think sometimes we're offering tier two or tier three to students that could could have benefited from a more robust tier one. So the more we build that up, the less students that, you know, we're going to, it'll be more clear and who needs the additional help. And so that's where we're always working on improving that, but that, that piece is, is, a, is an essential part of this work. Can I ask a question? Please. This is uh, Mackenzie from Laconia. Um, I'm, I'm curious about your ACES screener and how you go about doing that with students. Uh, we do something really similar here in, in our district. And I'm just curious, when you're when you're using an ACES screener or a version of that with students, are you getting parent permission before you're doing that? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, yeah, we could share with you the uh, there's an opt out form that we're using. Um, so so like we send that idea. out, and our parents mm -hmm. have the have they they have they can opt out. Uh, and and so we we have to always be clear about that. We have to go through and make sure the list because we have a student opt out. We need to make sure they don't take that that screener. Uh, and we. we can as, as a district, uh, Mackenzie, we have that in terms of surveys, we have it written into our policy for active consent uh, forms for the youngers. And then for the older kids, they can just opt out. That's awesome, thank you. Other questions for the El Rancho team? 
guess I just have uh, one question um, for everybody on the call. Are there other sites that are using similar forms uh, to, to what Jeff uh, shared during the during the presentation? And, and if not, Jeff, uh, I think, you know, getting those links or copies of those forms if possible for, for us to be able to share on Basecamp or through other means would be would be really beneficial for for your fellow grantees. Yeah, we'd be happy to share. Wonderful. Well, uh, last call for questions for the El Rancho team. Otherwise, we can uh, press forward with the final presentation from this from this cohort. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff, Dora, Sonia, Sandra. Thank, thank you so you. much for that for that presentation. Really appreciate it. Going to be uh, moving along in the agenda. Um, uh, lastly, we'll hear from uh, Laconia Public Schools in New Hampshire again. This is uh, Mackenzie Harrington uh, Bacot, uh, who's going to be um, providing us some uh, background on a school collaboration there with the local community uh, mental health center. Um, Mackenzie. Thank you, John. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you see my can you see my screen? Anybody? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I saw a nod. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure how to follow um, after that presentation. You guys said uh, a lot of very similar things that we're doing here in the district, except you guys are on a much more massive scale than we are. We're one school district in New Hampshire, uh, which is pretty small in comparison. Um, again, my name is Mackenzie Harrington Baycoat. I'm the grants administrator for this grant, as well as a plethora of other grants that we have in our district. And my office is called the Office of School Wellness. Oh, scrolling through. This presentation is obviously um, uh, thanks to OJJDP. And this is the disclaimer and acknowledgement of the funding that we are so fortunate to have from their office. So we use a multi-tiered system of support here in our district. And I know some of the other grantees do too. I don't know how many of you do. And, you know, just really quickly, I'm going to go through this. It's very basic. We know that all students benefit from consistent instruction and expectations and procedures. And that's really what is our universal foundational level, that green zone, that tier one, if you will. We know that some students need a little extra support, which is our yellow zone, our tier two. Um, those are all of our group interventions across our district. And then a few students, very individualized and intensive supports, which is our red zone, our, our tier three students, which is really what I'm here to talk about today and what the, uh, the last grantees were talking about as well. Um, in, in New Hampshire, we really have created kind of our own model of MTSS over the years. We've taken PBIS, which is Positive Behavioral Interventions and Support, and kind of anchored our multi-tiered systems of support in that, in that framework. And we've infused SEL, the Interconnected Systems Framework, which really is just a fancy school mental health programming. Our Student Assistance Program, which is really all of our substance misuse prevention and in intervention programming across the district. Trauma-sensitive schools and pyramid model, which is also basically PBIS, but for preschool. We're a pre-K uh, 12 district. And so we've taken this model, Let's pull this all up here. And these are just a couple of ways in which we use our tiered framework in working with our students and working with our families. So when you think of that universal level, and, I, and I'm including substance use supports in here, even though that part of our work is not funded by this grant, it's funded by a grant that we have with uh, the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services here in the state, um, as well as a large grant from the US Department of Education called Project Prevent. So we've braided a lot of that funding to allow us to have this really robust um, system across our district. And so we use, again, preventative education, project success uh, at our middle schools and high schools, uh, both in life skills at our elementary schools. And when you're looking at the family component of that, there's a lot of parent communication that goes out, whether it's webinars, just information dissemination, newsletters, really along that prevention line there. And at the tier two level, we do group counseling and we do um, small group prevention education. 
All of that we get parental consent for across the district. Uh, we involve the parents so that they know exactly what we're doing. Uh, our tier two groups, um, we use a variety of means to really assess our kids across the district. Sabres is a tool that we use in most of our buildings. It's just a screener, uh, social, academic, emotional, behavioral risk screener. That's just one of the ways. We almost refer to it like gates. What are the gates that kids go through to get hooked up with tier two and tier three supports and services? Um, and our tier two, it goes you know, anywhere from social skills, mindfulness, you know, you know zones and grief and loss, anxiety, um, anger management, CBITS, it really runs the gamut. And, and we change our tier two interventions on a semester basis, really based on what our student needs are presenting. So we don't decide in advance, these, these are the groups we're gonna run. We look at our students and we look at the needs. And if there's a need to run a grief group, we're gonna run a grief group. If there's not, then we don't do it at that time. And then our tier three teams are really the ways that kids um, where our teams come together, our tier three teams across the district consist of school counselors, social workers, licensed alcohol and drug counselor, our community-based mental health clinicians that are here in the buildings, um, special education, behavior support specialists, nurse, um, and then it kind of, it depends on every building if there are other specialists that they bring to the table or not. And those are the meetings where we have these really individualized conversations about kids, where we're talking about all kinds of things, McKinney Vento, are they homeless? Are they at risk of being homeless? Uh, is there principal incarceration? Are they court involved with uh, DCYF or juvenile justice? Uh, is truancy an issue? Are they failing every class? Are they going to the nurse repeatedly? Uh, are they having a lot of offices, office discipline referrals and suspensions hooked up with our restorative justice program, et cetera? So that is really the, the means that we put our mental health clinicians in with that one-to-one -one and how we get kids hooked up with them. Oh, looks like I didn't click all the things there. So through this grant in particular, these are the staff that we have that are funded. Um, I'm the part-time director. I'm sorry if I didn't say that in the beginning. We have a restorative justice coach um, at the high school, kind of pushes down into eighth grade as well. So it's a little bit middle school and high school. We have social workers in all of our buildings and this grant funds part of that. Uh, we do a lot of things outside of regular working hours with our staff, whether it's professional development, uh, you know, a variety of trainings or workshops or um, after school programming, uh, really trying to ca catch kids in that, you know, 3 to 7 p.m. kind of window of time and give them a place to be. New Hampshire is very cold in the wintertime. Uh, a lot of our kids who have, we, we have really high uh, free and reduced lunch rates, if you will. And so we know we have a lot of kids in the wintertime that need to physically be in our buildings because they don't have heat at home possibly. Um, they don't have food at home. So we work really hard to provide additional after school programming that also provides dinners to all of our kids for free. And then two main partnerships that we have through this grant, uh, Lakes Region Mental Health Center, which is our community mental health center um, and our ACERT partnership, which is our partnership with our Family Resource Center and our police department. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. We fund a tremendous amount of professional development through uh, this project as well. And this is just pretty much a huge list of the things that we do. Um, I'm just going down the list here. Renew, if you're not familiar with that, that is a one-to-one -one, uh, wraparound individualized process for uh, at-risk youth. It's really meant to help them develop their goals for the future and transition out of high school and into college or career or life, whatever it is. Diversity and cultural competence. I've been uh, serving as our in-house uh, certified facilitator for this for about seven years now. Bully prevention, suicide prevention. I think most states have a legal mandate. I'm not certain what they are. Here in New Hampshire, we're required to legally provide two hours of suicide prevention for all staff, uh, literally everybody, custodians, food service workers, all of our volunteers, our bus drivers um, every year. Crisis prevention intervention training. So verbal de-escalation is a big focus. Youth mental health support. So youth mental health first aid is an easy example that most of you are probably familiar with. SEL supports, mindfulness, 
um, and really any other tier two intervention. So if we have a need that arises and we don't have anyone trained in the district and in a certain intervention we wanna utilize, then we'll send them off or virtually have them do it these days. Uh, and then school safety, that's another big part of this as well. So ACERT for us is our Adverse Childhood uh, Experiences Response Team. And, and like I said a minute ago, that's a partnership between our police department and our Family Resource Center. Members of that team, and, and I know you can read it here, um, they're all trained in trauma. So we use this grant actually to train all of our ACERT partners. While we're the three main partners, every community serving system in our community is actually also a member of this as well. And we think of it almost like a tiered system where we're the central people and then we're referring out to all of these other providers. And so we bring them all together monthly for a meeting to stay connected. And through that, we've had everyone trained in trauma-informed practices and all of our police officers have been trained in this as well. Uh, the gist of it is, and I think I mentioned this quickly yesterday, when police officers are in a home uh, for whatever reason, oftentimes it is a violence-related, victimization-related event, um, and there are children in the home, they work with the family to try to get that family to sign off on a release to allow them to share that information, very basic information with our family resource center, such as location, name, event, very basic stuff. If we do get that release signed, that family is immediately connected with a family peer resource specialist from our family resource center. They then start, but almost become like their one-to-one -one case manager. They work with that family to determine, are these students school age or are they not? And if they are school age, where do they go to school? And when they determine that, that's when we become involved. And we only become involved if that's the case. If it's a family with toddlers and they're not quite school ready, or maybe there's no, you know, maybe they are um, of school age, but attend school in a different district, then we are never notified of that information. And so then from there, that enables our social workers to immediately connect with the family and the resource center to start working with that family to really wrap around them and figure out what, what they need. Um, and again, we immediately connect them to trauma-informed supports at school and the community. We make sure they have um, after-school programming if it's needed, any recreational opportunities. Um, oftentimes, our, our students don't have the socioeconomic means to take advantage of a lot of the opportunities in the community. And so we will work with that family and find funding to make that happen for them. We also make sure parents are connected to the mental health center as they need to be through this process. Uh, substance use treatment, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, parent education, uh, home visits is an ongoing part of this as well. All really meant to help build the family up so that they can really mitigate a lot of the barriers that they're experiencing in their life. Um, so our main, uh, actually our only community mental health partners, it's sort of the only community mental health center in our county that provides all of these supports. Um, they're called Lakes Region Mental Health Center. And we have two mental health clinicians, uh, two master's level clinicians that come into our middle school and our high school two days a week. If we could have them more, we would. I know someone asked a question in the last presentation about um, are there enough clinicians for the need? And we do not have enough clinicians for the need. Um, in fact, we, they're, they're often not in our buildings two days because they physically cannot be because they have so many clients community-based that they're seeing as well. Um, but we've developed an MOU with them. It includes a data sharing agreement so that we're allowed to really swap that information. Um, the funding that we use from this grant with them though really is minimal because most of the cost that they incur is billable to Medicaid, billable to private insurance because the students become their, their one-to-one -one client. Um, however, we pay for their time with us. We pay for them to be a part of our tier three teams and our tier two teams when they can. If they're doing a group intervention for us, we also fund that because that's not uh, billable under those private mechanisms. Um, if they're meeting with our school counselors or, or school social workers or anything like that, we pay for that. Uh, retreats in the summer where we're bringing our staff together, we pay for them to do that. And we offer all of our professional development to them that all of our internal staff receive as well. Um, we also, uh, just one thing I wanna note, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have experienced this, it was a, a very steep uphill learning curve for our clinicians to kind of acclimate to an education environment and for both of our systems to kind of come to a common language, if you will. Um, 
we had to kind of back down our edge of speak and they had to kind of back down their clinical speak, if, if <laughs> that makes any sense. And so we feel really good about where we're at with them at this point in time. One of the things that we found is really key is doing uh, a facilitative referral process with our families, as well as uh, we require that any family whose child accesses them on site in our buildings has to sign a release form. And it's a release form through their, through their organization, not through us that enables the mental health clinician to actually speak about the child and our two or three teams to be a part of that team wrapping around that child. Because we found in the past when we don't have that release signed, it's a, it's a really significant barrier to us being able to help them on site in the building. And so our facilitated referral process, it's pretty basic. Um, I think some people feel like it's rocket science, but it's just it's so basic. You, it's like almost like a warm handoff. So our, our social workers or a counselor or a behavior support specialist, whoever is that person connected with that kid in, in the closest way, they'll call mom, they'll call dad, and they'll say, hey, this is where we're at. This is what we're thinking. This is what we'd like to do. And they get their permission to move forward with that facilitated referral process. And so the school signs off on it, the tier team, and it goes through our tiered teams so that it's a very systematic approach in the way that we do it. And we found that this really helps the relationship building and the family engagement and the de-stigmatizing of mental health issues. Um, so that's something that we found really important in that process. Um, positive impacts to date. Let me just pull all these up. Some of these, again, are not directly funded by this project, but because our, our work is so braided together, I, I just felt it was really relevant to share. Uh, you know, we, we know that substance misuse is really a common co-occurring issue with mental health. And so for us, I can't really parcel the two out when we're talking about this work. And so for us right now, again, I, I looked at the numbers from the last presentation. Like, oh my gosh, 900 and some kids. That's amazing. Um, we have 40 middle school and high school kids, which is a lot for us, who um, receive on-site counseling every year. Um, and, you know, even with our licensed alcohol, alcohol and drug counselor, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm misspeaking, 40 students who access the licensed alcohol and drug counselor. But what we have found over time, and I know the last people referenced this as well, is that as they become an embedded fabric of your community, your school community, kids will self-refer. They bring their friends. And so it's been really fascinating to watch that happen. 20% um, of our students receive tier two services, uh, which I gave a lot of examples of earlier. And again, it's a variety of staff who provide those depending on their skill set. We have 25 middle and high school kids who receive that one-to-one -one individual mental health counseling on site. And when you take into account that we only have them two days a week and to see eight kids, 10 kids in a week, that takes about a day and a half. And so we're really limited in our time and they're really maxed out in what they can provide. If we could have them every day of the week, we would. Um, they have been short staffed for about a decade now. I mean, it just feels like every year it gets harder and harder and harder to get their time. As mental health in schools has taken off in our state, they're in very high demand across our, across our county. Um, so we're fortunate that we do have that. We have a ton of other students who see them on site in the community. So I didn't put any of our community data, but we, we do track our community referrals and uh, our school to community mental health center referrals. Um, and again, all schools refer students and families to community health supports. And we have home visiting happening across our district to meet whatever need that our families are facing. And I feel like I'm speaking really fast, but that is the gist of it. So if anybody has any questions, fire away. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. And yes, uh, the floor is open for, for questions. Mackenzie, I have a question. Thank you, first of all, for all of that wonderful information. Um, Early on your presentation, you spoke, spoke about utilizing the savers. You know, that's something that a, a survey that we've been looking at. Um, do you use uh, in your district, do you use a paper? Are you utilizing some type of online format like connected to FastBridge? Like we're just interested in, in gaining more information on that. You know, what your experience has been with utilizing that survey? Sandra, that's a great, really great question. Um, we used FastBridge for our elementary schools. So it's done electronically for, uh, for all of our elementary schools. FastBridge doesn't make sense for us. Beyond that, really, it's not meant for that. So we have a paper version, but it's really electronic at the same time that we have a partnership with um, 
one of our university systems here in the state through a different grant that we have, and they developed it for us. Um, there was no other way for us to, we, we tried doing it manually and it just was really a pain. So we've had it created electronically um, because they also have uh, a system um, a completely different data so developed for us. So they have rosters of all of our kids already in there. So it was easy to connect it with that system. So that's what we do for, for our middle school. We've actually really struggled implementing Sabres at the high school. Um, and that is the one area that we don't. And we have tried year after year to kind of soundboard and problem solve how to do that. It comes down to, for us, how do you identify a high school teacher who has that relationship with a kid in the same way that like a second grade teacher is gonna have with their students? And so we've really struggled with that. Um, so we have not used Sabres and I don't think we will. We use a lot of other ways that, that are really unique to a high school setting, but that's a really great question. Thank you very much. Other questions for Mackenzie? I did have a, a quick question. Um, I think I, uh, and correct me if I misunderstood this, but was it correct um, that in your district, um, when there's a referral for a mental health agency or community agency, or maybe just at all for mental health services, did you mention that the team, there's like a tier two team or like a site team that like comes together to um, uh, meet regarding students that have been referred and are those regular meetings? I just was curious about that piece. Yeah, that's a great question too. Uh, it's our tier three team in our building. So that team whose role is specifically to look at individual students. They don't talk about groups. They don't talk about universal. They're really only talking about all of those kids who fall into that category of we have to work very closely one-to-one, -one, whatever that means for them. Not all of them are mental health. Um, some of them are just experiencing homelessness. And I say just as if that's not enough, um, mm -hmm. but that is the team that really comes together. And they do, it's almost like it comes through that team and they say, and they talk very openly about what they're seeing from the student, what they're hearing from their classroom teachers and uh, or administration and, and, and whether or not they believe that the student is in need of mental health and the mental health clinicians at, at that team. So she's also a part of that conversation mm -hmm to parcel out what's being seen. And so then a member of the tier three team, typically the person with the closest relationship with that student, there's a social worker, behavior support specialist, school counselor, or even the LADAC. Who are, our LADAC is actually a duly certified mental health clinician and an employee of our district. So that's a, a unique situation that we have there. Um, they will then reach out to the family. And we really focus heavily on family engagement. And so we have just felt like we really need the family involved in this piece. Um, and so it, we, we call it a facilitated process so that they have mom and or dad's permission before we do anything, before that referral actually goes to the community mental health center, we get their permission in advance so that they're mm -hmm. on board with it. The one caveat to that is we do not do this at our elementary level for a very specific reason. And that is mm -hmm. basically we found, we did it for years and we found that unless they were doing child par parent psychotherapy, it really wasn't getting the student anywhere forward because that student was just going home to that same cycle, that same cycle with the family. It was like Groundhog Day. And we have a very select number of uh, clinicians in our county that can provide child parent psychotherapy and we're not able to get them on site. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, we, so all of our elementary students, if you will, are referred to the community organization itself. I see. Thank you. I think you mentioned, Mackenzie, the, all the members of the, the team for this particular project trained in, in trauma-informed care. Um, mm -hmm. Does that include the, the police department? And if so, any challenges with kind of maintaining consistency with, with personnel there for, for this particular project? Um, yes, all of our officers have been trained, um, pretty lengthy training, actually. Um, we haven't really had consistency issues. Um, I mean, they're definitely always looking for more police officers but we haven't really seen a lot of turnover. Um, we've been fortunate in that way. So that's remained pretty steady, which I wish I could say about education. <laughs> Other questions for Mackenzie, or I believe James taking a, a peek at the clock, we can transition into the, the larger kind of overall uh, peer learning group uh, discussion for the, for the last 10 minutes. So not only questions for Mackenzie, but for 
um, the, the other two great presentations from, from earlier in the session and, and really welcome uh, uh, questions, comments, um, or, or requests uh, during this, this final, final 10 minutes of the session. Thank you. So hopefully this is a you know a good opportunity for if your sites are doing something similar maybe share either um, documents or tools that you are utilizing that might be um, you know something complementary. I know um, Jeff and and Sandra and Sonia you shared a couple of the tools that you guys use. Maybe are there other sites that are using similar tools or seeing things that are um, helpful in engaging both um students and your community partners in this work all right none <clears throat> what about um and Mackenzie, when, when Mackenzie and I talk, one of the things I always get interested in is that um, the work with the mental health center um, allows them to utilize um, Medicaid dollars, I think it is. Do other schools use these um, community health centers to be engaged to, to, to be able to pay for this work through Medicaid or other dollars that be, allows you to you know, um, see more, engage more um, students? Yeah, hi, this is Yvette from Chester. So our model is currently um, obviously being funded as a part of our program design through OJJDP, but one of the things that, it's been an ongoing discussion, and uh, one of the things that we are being really intentional about um, this year, as we move into the latter stages of the grant, um, is actually having those discussions with the representative at the um, uh, Children's Behavioral Health Unit to talk about, hey, how can we now shift these services to the Medicare, right? And so where will be medical billing, um, and it won't interrupt the services that our students and families are receiving, um, because the grant funds may be exhausted. So we're having those discussions. I don't know what's happening in other states, but I know for the state of Pennsylvania, which is where we're located, um, there are just a lot of different policy and political changes that are happening um, above and underneath and around us. Uh, us meaning, I guess, the little guys, we're not really, you know, um, we don't have a seat at the table, but there are some big decisions that are being made that may, you know, impact or drive the um, force around what's going to happen as it relates to um, medical billing, right? And like Medicare being able to pay for uh, mental health services, right? So that whole billable, billable hour model is definitely adjusting and adapting. So we've been using our um, point of contact internally with the mental health facility as our uh, TA, if you will. So she's been helping us navigate those waters. She's quite much closer to it than we are as a school. Thanks, I bet. Anybody else? Yep. We use a similar, um, James, with billing Medicaid mm -hmm. uh, for the students. I can speak to, um, and I mean, I spoke to it in our presentation, but out will around show here in LA County in California, um, you know, the agencies were hit really hard. We're still seeing that. And so we, this school year, we had all of our agency partners, which traditionally they meet capacity for the school year, I would say around <clears throat> maybe February, March, we start hearing that, you know, there's a lot less um, intakes available. All of our agencies have been full since November. Um, and so even prior to that, it's interesting because it was this flip from during the pandemic when everything sort of halted our agencies were reaching out to us because they hardly had any referrals. Uh, I had feedback from um, said more than one that said during the pandemic, we were their number one referral source. So like mental health services were much needed, right? But the linkages were sort of halted. So it's really interesting that 
there was this period of time where they were desperately wanting referrals, right? And I say desperately in the sense that they wanted to maintain, right, their staff be able to bill, right, because they have quotas and things like that. Um, and we tried our best to continue the referrals going, but it was just so different. And then when we returned, it was this opposite shift where it's like, where there was, they were full really soon. And so um, we're just sort of going with it, maintaining that ongoing communication with our partners, um, but understanding that, you know, they're bound sometimes with the billing process. It's a bit different for them. They have different challenges. And I know there's a lot of competition right now, at least in California, with um, fully remote formats, right? So like us being in public school district and returning to in-person, I could say that, um, you know, some agencies are, or most agencies are struggling to maintain staff that are still willing to go into the schools and provide this work uh, because there's so much more uh, similar pay and, and flexible hours and it's like completely working from home, but we don't have the luxury to offer to our students to connect to remote therapy while in school, right? Because then there's a challenge around supervision. We've had several partners ask us around that. So just really interesting new um, challenges that have came up for us here in Orlando. Thank you, Sonia. Just to add to that real fast, so Los Angeles County only only allows two school districts to uh, to bill directly. So they have a partnership with them. They, they have not opened it up to other school districts that so were on the smaller side. So that's why Sonia was talking about. We have to work with partner agencies, bring them in because they have those contracts, but they're not allowing the Los Angeles County has not opened up those contracts. So um, I'm sitting, I'm a little envious of all of you get to do that, have, you know, build Medicare here with your, with your, uh, with your counties. Our, ours is not, uh, has not allowed that yet. Anybody else, anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, John. Uh, hat tip. Um, thank you. We will uh, go on break now and we'll see you all at 1.45. And we're looking forward to hearing from Chester, Spokane, and Austin. So uh, we'll see you in about 14 minutes. <laughs>